we've been hearing how the notion or concept of inertness arises and then bounces down into the conception of materiality like a rock from a hilltop. It's very hard to get over this notion of materiality. It's in your face, as they say. Materiality has an immediate impact. But the, the whole point here is that it's a notion. Materiality is a notion. We can say there's movement and resistance if we want to get fundamental. If we want to describe things at a more fundamental level. There's movement and resistance. There's movement and resistance. So that's a basic division that we can make. And then it's on that division that we base a whole notion of materiality. If there was no resistance to movement, there would be no materiality, no or no sense of materiality. And it's this materiality, this notion of materiality, which is at the heart of our belief that there's an external world out there. And this is what we do all the time. If you're actually watching this video and following it or paying attention to it or trying to understand it, then you're not thinking of it in terms of pixels on a screen and sound coming through your speakers. You're, you're watching it probably almost as if you were attending a talk or as if I was in the room. Perhaps you might interrupt more if I was actually in the room. But you're not thinking of this video as a little square of moving pixels. You're probably thinking that I'm a real person. That there's a real person behind this. You construct a reality. You might even have constructed certain ideas about me. Who I am, what sort of person I am. You've built up some sort of picture, some, or got some sense or tone about what's being presented here and about who I might be. This is what we do. We construct a reality and then we'll take evidence elsewhere to either reinforce that picture of reality or to adjust it slightly depending on our character really, on our tendencies. So this, we build up this appearance, the illusion of world appearance. Vasishta continued, when one thus falls into this illusion of world appearance, he is at once preyed upon by countless other illusions which arise in the original illusion. Just like insects arise after the rain. It's a swarm. We get caught up in a swarm of notions, of illusions. The mind is like a forest in spring, bursting out all over. It is so dense with very many notions and concepts that dense darkness prevails in it. Vasishta had just descended into a forest, but it was a dry and dusty forest. So I suppose that's what these, this bursting forest does. It sucks the nutrients from the soil. On account of self-limitation or ignorance, people undergo countless experiences of pleasure and pain in this world. There is no difference between the sage and the moon. Both of them radiate joy. The moon is very important in Indian literature. After the heat of the sun, you've got the coolness of the moon, which radiates, which creates the nectar of immortality. 
They are peaceful, cool and tranquil, full of immortalizing nectar, and they enable one to see. There is no difference between the ignorant and the child. They are motivated in their lives by whims and fancies. They do not reflect what was nor what will be, and they are devoid of right conduct. Well, this is a strange description because the sage isn't normally concerned with what was nor with what will be and this condition is often compared favourably with that of a child. But it's true, a child does give in to their whims and fancies. I think the idea here is that they don't have the big picture. The sage has the big picture. And although centred in the here and now, the sage also has a perspective on notions of the past and the future. So the sage is not ruled by whims and fancies as the ignorant and the child are. No one, from the creator down to the smallest insect, can attain supreme peace unless he acquires perfect control of the mind. <laughs>